Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Um, we, last week we finished with um, the center part of Paul's writing here to the church um, where he had, he had moved out of rebuke and reproof well, actually, chapter 12, he was, he, he was still kind of rebuking them for how they handled the Lord's table. And uh, then he moved over into uh, chapter, um, I'm, I'm sorry, chapter 11 was where he kind of dealt with how they handled the Lord's table. And then he moved into chapter 12, 13, and 14 and was uh, uh, discussing spiritual gifts, the attitude by which those gifts were to operate, how they were to be functioning in the church. And... Um, so he spent three chapters on that, how tongues and interpretation of tongues and how the, you know, the, the different things of how they would be operating and not to forbid speaking with tongues. Um, but it, and, of course, we kept coming back to in chapter 14, his overall uh, theme um, kept being uh, order in the church, proper order in the church, not, you know, he wasn't trying to stop anything from working. He was just trying to bring proper order and proper attitude how things operate. Paul then moves into the 15th chapter. And... Um, and, and really in this 15th chapter, he, he gives a defense of the core of the gospel. Um, and, I, and I'm sure that there were things that had happened in the letters that were written to him and his visits with the church at Corinth that uh, uh, caused him to write this part. But it, it seems that he's, going, he's beginning to move over now in, in defense of the gospel, reiterating certain things as he works toward his closing, uh, and then talks about some things in chapter 16. So verse uh, chapter 1. I mean, chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, and also you have received, and wherein ye stand. But which also ye are, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory or hold fast what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now, um, one of the things we, we understand here is that you can believe with your head and not with your heart, and it doesn't mean anything. In other words, you can say, well, your head, well, I, yeah, I agree, I agree with that, or I believe that, but you're, it's not coming from your heart. Remember, J Jesus said in Mark 11 that if you believe with your heart and say with your mouth, uh, you'll have what you say. Remember, uh, what things shall you desire? And I'm sorry. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. And then Paul writes in Romans, the uh, 10th chapter, in verse 8, 9, and 10, and he says this, you know, that confession is made with, if you, if you believe in your heart that God's raised Jesus from the dead, and confess with your mouth that he's, he's uh, uh, Lord, you'll be saved. You have to believe in your heart. Heart belief. There can be a head belief, okay? In other words, you go, yeah, I believe that, but you, it's not here. It's not out of the spirit. Not just, not, not physical heart, but your spirit. And so Paul says, you know, uh, if you, believe, if you hold fast what I've kept preaching to you, unless you believe in vain. And the way you can believe in vain is to do it with your head, not with your heart. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. I like this next few verses, or a couple of verses. And that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And so Paul um, takes back and, and argues that Jesus would die and be buried and rise according to the Scriptures. What's Old Testament? It's all in the Old Testament, all right? And he, he's saying, according to the Scriptures, these things came to pass. And he was buried and rose the third day according to the Scriptures. And then he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, and then of the twelve. And after that, he was seen above, the fi above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Now, Paul's writing some years afterwards and saying that many of the 500 people that saw Jesus after his resurrection were still alive, although some of them had died. Okay? So he was seen first by Peter, then by the 12, then by the 500. All right? So there, there's, there was witnesses to the, the physical bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at last, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Now, he saw when Jesus appeared to him on the Damascus Road. Remember, Jesus appeared to him. And said, Paul, or Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Okay? As, as he was uh, seen to me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles. Then I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So Paul say, you know, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. Um, I persecuted the church. I am the least of those that are apostles. 
but by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Oh, we do not want to make the grace of God in vain, do we? We want to make it profitable. Hallelujah. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me, with me. So Paul's saying um, that although he was the least of the apostles, he was born out of time, he didn't, he didn't walk with the ministry of Jesus, um, he was the least of apostles because he persecuted the church, yet by the grace of God, he became what he was, which we understand uh, historically, he became the greatest of the apostles. And he said that it was because of the grace of God. Now, listen, he did what he did. He said, I labored more abundantly. Some people get the idea the grace of God means you don't do anything. He said, I labored more abundantly. Yet not I, the grace, not the grace within him. In other words, the strengthening grace that empowered him to do what he did was within him. But let's say this, understand this. It didn't make him do it. He had to cooperate. You've got to cooperate with God. You've got to cooperate with his, his, his anointing. You have to cooperate with his faith. You have to cooperate with his grace. You have to do your part. And then, then what you can't do or are unable to do, unable to do, he takes over and empowers you to do it. Remember, I told someone uh, today, I was talking to someone, and they were, you know, doing, you know, I was talking about the Holy Spirit is the holy helper, not the holy doer. You know, he's the paracletos. He's the helper, not the doer. When we, uh, we pray in, the, we pray in our tic, uh, lang uh, languages, our tongues, uh, our inar inarticulate speech, the Bible tells us that he helpeth us. The word helpeth means it takes hold together with us against. He helps us. Paul's saying, you know, that, you know, although he labored more abundantly, the grace of God's what really empowered him to be able to labor more abundantly. Amen. You can't do it all in your strength. You can't do it in your ability. You can't do it. Um, and that almost sounds like an oxymoron or, or, a, or double talk. Uh, but, the, but the fact of the matter is we have to work with God in order for the grace of God and the power of God to work in us and to work through us. You can't steer a ship that's docked. You can't steer a parked car. Amen. You got to put it in motion. Power steering is going. How many have power steering in your cars? Now, you, everybody. How many has an old car that doesn't have power steering? You had to put one of the little knobs on it that, that you could <laughs> go around like this with. My granddaddy had one. You know, put a little bitty knob on it, attached to your steering wheel. You could take that thing and you could, it, 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 it helped. <laughs> you know, uh, I remember learning how to drive when, when you know, you, you grab that steering wheel or something. Yeah. You know, I did that. I used to, when I, I worked for a company. We set up mobile homes. You take what they call the toter. That's that little that truck that pulls the, the mobile homes down the road. You get on, and we didn't have power steering. You get onto a lot, and you have to. They always put me in there when we got to the lot. They got to drive on the road when it was, you know, just mm, get on the lot where you had to go mm, 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 and, and, and move two inches, and then go mm, 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 and move two inches. That's that was how I did. I don't know why. Well, I guess I was the gorilla of the bunch. They, they always put because we didn't have power steering. But how many know, you know, with power steering, man, you can take one hand and your finger, put it up on there and, and lock it and, and, and do this, and it'll go, yeah, yeah. but guess what? I got all that power steering, and if I don't put my finger in and turn it, it won't do anything. Yeah. It'll sit right there in that same direction until I get engaged with it. And then the power steering kicks in and helps. Paul's basically saying he labored more abundantly, yet not him the grace. The grace of God kicks in when you start doing your part. It'll kick in and help you. Amen. Okay, therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so we believed. Now, 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 Paul's getting ready to give a defense of the resurrection. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? Now, apparently in this time frame, there were people who believed in baptizing for the dead. Now, Paul was, Paul was in no way. Everybody say, no way. Affirming, condoning, establishing his doctrine, the practice of baptizing for the dead. He was using it as an argument. Basically, if you don't believe in the resurrection, why are you baptizing for the dead? Because, you know, apparently the same ones are saying they didn't believe in the resurrection, baptized for the dead. And Paul was, you know, Paul, very rhetorical a lot of times, would use uh, things against people, use arguments to show the fallacy. You know, we do that all the time in politics. We show the fallacy of stuff. We say, you know, if people are born homosexual, well, then, you know, if they're born homosexual, then you can't say they're not born pedophiles. 
And who are we to judge the pedophile? If the pedophile uh, says he's born that way, you said the homosexual is born that way, then we need to allow pedophiles to marry their children that want to marry. Now, that's, I know that's sick and that's gross, but you know what? That's the same argument. It is a, it is a rhetorical argument. And, and Paul was doing the same thing in that day. He was saying, if you, believe, if you don't believe in the resurrection, why are you baptizing for the dead if there's not a resurrection? He wasn't saying that he believed in baptizing for the dead. He's saying your practice doesn't make sense. Your belief and your practice don't line up. You know, you're saying there's no resurrection, yet you're baptizing for the dead. It makes no sense. Okay? And you know, listen to this. And if Christ... Um, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? In other words, if there is no resurrection. Now, how many remember the, how to tell the difference between the Pharisee and the Sadducee? See, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, so they were fair, you see. And the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, so they were sad, you see. Okay? <laughs> there you go. I know they, they just, that's too simple. Hey, it helps. It works. Works in English. I don't know if it works in French, but it works in English. Okay? Hallelujah. This is verse 14. If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. And, if you're, and, and your faith all, is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses to God because we testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so, be the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and ye are yet in your sins. And they which also are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now basically Paul is saying if Christ is not raised from the dead, everything we're doing is, is, is useless. The crux of the gospel is the, resurre the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, physically raised from the dead. That is the very crux of Christianity. Without that, there is nothing. Paul said, our preaching is in vain. Your faith is in vain. And in this life, we're just miserable because we're believing a lie. Because let's face it. If Jesus didn't die and was, and, and was not raised from the dead, and no one gets raised from the dead, and there's no resurrection of the dead, then, man, you may as well just party hardy and take yourself right on into the afterlife, which there doesn't even exist, and make sure you have a good time getting there. That's what Paul is saying. He, he's, he's coming against them saying, you know, you, you just, why would you even serve Christ if you don't believe in the resurrection? It's useless. Then they also which are, are, are perished or in Christ are perished, I mean, asleep in Christ are perished. If only in this life we have hope in Christ, then we are all of most men most miserable, miserable. Then Paul comes right back. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, this does not mean everybody gets saved. If you're made alive, it's made alive in Christ. Okay, you, you got to take everything with the context of the whole. He's not saying that everybody's going to get saved. See, you, you can take a scripture like this, run out and jump out, and uh, you get yourself in trouble and teach things that are wrong. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. That means those who have already died in Christ. You understand that? Those that come to Christ at his coming, those who have already fallen asleep in Christ. Afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, who he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he put, have put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put, uh, put all things under his feet. Now, everything's going to be put in the feet of Jesus, even death. Okay? And then it says, when he hath put all things under his feet, I'm sorry, I didn't know if I couldn't call that a Holy Ghost sneeze, but I felt a sneeze coming on. He hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith he all things are put under his feet, under his under him, it is manifest that he is accepted. In other words, everything's under Jesus' feet except Jesus. He's not under his own feet. Okay? Which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that shall put all things under him, that God may be all and in all. In other words, at the end of all things, after all things are put under the feet of Jesus, Jesus will be submitted to the Father. 
The Father will put all things under the feet of Jesus, and then Jesus, after that has taken place, will then submit himself uh, completely to the Father again in that sense where the Father, you know, well, the Father still is the head of the Godhead. But, it, you know, in other words, he said he won't take over heaven. The Father's going to put all things under Jesus' feet, but then Jesus will be subjected to the Father, okay? He is not under, it's not all under his feet yet. In other words, he, he's not under there yet. He is, he's still, everything's under the feet of Jesus. At that point, all things will be put under the Father. Else, what shall they do that are baptized for the dead? The dead rise not. Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand ye in jeopardy every hour? In other words, now, why are they constantly putting themselves in harm's way for the gospel if, if they don't believe in the resurrection? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily, or I face you know, dire circumstances or death daily. In other words, people tried to kill Paul and all kinds of stuff. Uh, if after the manner of men I thought would be said Ephesus, there is belief that maybe he had, you know, there, there was, he was pers persecuted to the point of having to fight wild beasts or he could be making a, an, an allegorical uh, response here. He fought with the beast of men who persecuted him. Uh, we, we don't really know for sure, but either way, he, he used that statement. I, well, I fought with beasts at Ephesus. What advantage is it to me if the dead rise not? In other words, why am I putting my life in danger if the dead are not raised? You'd be a fool to put your life in danger for something that's not going to happen. He's arguing for the resurrection. Let us, you know, he said this, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Didn't I just say that earlier, you know, just party harder your way on the way out? Paul said, if, if man, the dead don't rise, let us eat and drink and tomorrow we'll die. Be not deceived. <laughs> Evil communications corrupt good manners. In other words, communications, uh, um, evil lifestyles, evil people. Listen to what he says now in verse 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And, but men, some men will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Now here, see, I'll tell you something. One of the, one of the things we've run into historically in the church, and it started out with Paul. I mean, it's not like it's something new to this age. The, philosoph the, the philosophical approach of this age of men and women, the educational institutions, you know, our, our institutions of higher learning, I mean, we could almost, almost call them the institutions of demonic learning, you know. I mean, you really have to, you know, you have to watch what goes on and, you know, uh, just keep me on my soapbox, Lord, please. Well, many of our institutions have just become places to brainwash the kids. You know, they have an agenda. Now, uh, one of our kids was in school. I won't, I'm, you know, you may figure some stuff out, but one of our kids was in school um, last semester, semester, either last semester or last spring, and they had a, had a religion teacher. And that religion teacher was going to shove, uh, you know, uh, is it really a sin, and push uh, homosexual films down their throat about how it was okay in a religion class. We dropped it. The teacher's no longer there. They got let go. I'm sure the other, other kids went and started complaining and the, the, the president got ahead of it and said, Whip, we don't need you. You know, we, we, we're, we're not sending our kids. It was a private school, so you got a little more leeway because the state, you don't have any leeway. They do all kind of perverse stuff in our state universities. They, they, they have lesbians come in uh, and, and, I mean, and, and carry out lesbian acts in front of the class. I mean, you, 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 you still know. Our universities now use CBE and CE instead of BC and AD. All you go look at, go find you a textbook that's current. Before current era, BCE, before current era and current era, replacing before Christ and Anno Dominio or whatever. Somebody help me with that word. Anno Domina, in the year of our Lord. They're replacing that with BCE. That sounds close, doesn't it? Somebody goes, oh, that's before Christ. I don't know what the E stands for. No, BCE is before current era and CE is current era. And that's how they're dating everything in the textbooks now. They're dating them with the BCE and the CE. It's, it's, it's an agenda, okay? And so, um, eh, you, you get philosophical as a Christian, you'll get in trouble. Stay with the word. But some will say, well, how are the dead raised up and what body do they come? See, you, and Paul, Paul kind of felt the way I do. Thou fool! <laughs> That's what he said. I'm just, just reading Paul. Okay. That which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. 
And thou which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that it shall be, but bare grain. It may have a chance of wheat or of some other grain. Now, Paul is going to sit, uh, go through this next few verses and talk about bodies celestial, bodies terrestrial. But what he's doing is ex establishing the doctrine that the body that dies in this earth, the corrupted body, will not be the body you get at the resurrection. Okay? And so, but people think, well, if your body dies, how are you going to have it resurrected? Because, you know, it goes to dust and it gets scattered to brown and, you know, this, you know, just hold on. It's, it's going to be different. And God is a supernatural God. He's bigger than you. He can figure stuff out you can't figure out. Hello? But God giveth it a body as it has pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh, and I said what he's saying here is that when you, when you die, your body is sown, and that is the seed for your resurrected body. You won't get that body back. You will, your, so, your death is the seed sown. Understand, remember, the only way you get to enter into heaven as a new creation is to be, be born into the earth. And be born again. And so he's saying is that your body dying is the deposit or the seed sown for the, the promise of the resurrected body. But when that body's resurrected, it won't be the body you sowed. It'll be a different body. See, you know, and we've kind of believed in the church, you know, somehow God's going to go get all of our DNA and all the dust all over the world, bring it all back together and put it back. No, you're getting a different body. The death of your body was the seed sown. You established your right to have a glorified body by physically dying in the earth and letting that seed be sown into the earth. In other words, that gives you the right to get one of those bodies. Because you were born, you were human, you died, and, and your body went to the ground, and there was a seed sown. But God giveth it a body as has pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, flesh of beasts, uh, another of fishes, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. You all do get celestial and terrestrial, heavenly and earthly. There is one glory of the sun, one glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, one star differeth from another in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is sown in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Now, hallelujah. See, spiritual bodies walk through walls. Jesus, they went in like the whole room and Jesus appeared to them with a physical body, but it was a spiritual physical body. It was a glorified body. It wasn't, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the body like man has. It, it was spiritual, okay? Spiritually natural. How can it be spiritual and natural at the same time? That's, that's, this is the new kind of flesh. It is the incorruptible flesh. It is the flesh of honor. Hallelujah. As it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last man, Last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Jesus is the last Adam. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. Now, Adam was the first one, okay? The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthly, such are they that are earthly, and as is the heaven, such are they that are heavenly. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the earthly. Now, we have borne the image of Adam in our corruptible bodies. When Jesus comes back, we're going to bear the image of his body, which is spiritual or heavenly. Glory to God. Now, that's just, right. that's just awesome because it won't be subject, subject to disease. It won't be subject to death. It won't be subject to corruption. It will be a glorified heavenly body. Praise God. Amen. He says, if we born the image of the earthly. Now, understand this. All those who've died in Christ do not have their bodies yet, their spiritual bodies. We know that, uh, and we'll get to that. Hallelujah. But we're going to, that when Jesus comes back, we're going to get our, we're going to bear the image that he has. So the body we have now, you're not, this is not what's going to heaven, folks. Hello? This is not what's going to heaven. 
We've borne the image of the earthly body of Adam. Now when Jesus comes back, we're going to bear the image of the heavenly body of Je like Jesus's. Glory to God. This I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but, all, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the trump, last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Now what happens first? Remember, Jesus is coming back. Those who, who die in Christ do not have their glorified, incorruptible, heavenly or spiritual bodies. When they come, guess what? They get theirs first. They get theirs first. Amen? And now it says, so when um, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. They sowed their seed into death uh, to getting their body. And we shall be changed. In other words, those that are alive at the coming of the Lord, you shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So in this corruptible shall I put on incorruption, this mortal shall I put on immortality. Then shall be brought the past to saying that uh, is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O grave, where is thy sting? I mean, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So Paul now has given a defense of the resurrection, at the same time giving instruction. He's instructing them about the resurrection, how it's going to be. You know, and, and answering questions that people have tried to, in, in a philosophical way, how am I going to get raised up if I'm dead? My, my body's decayed. It's become ashes, the ashes and dust to dust. You don't get that one back. That's why. Yeah. You, you, you've sown the seed for the glorified one. Well, praise the Lord. And I said, hallelujah. Can I tell you something? I don't want this one back. And you probably kind of look at yours and go, I really don't want this one either. Now, you're going to look a lot like you did with this one. It just won't be subject to all the things this one is. How do you know? They recognize Jesus. Unless he hid himself from them, you know. They recognized the Lord. It wasn't, he wasn't so, you know, they didn't, when they, when they, when they went, oh, Master or Rabboni or whatever, you know, my Lord and my God, they didn't go, man, you don't look the same. <laughs> you don't hear him saying that, do you? Man, I, you really Jesus? Because I don't recognize you. That's not what was going on. Hallelujah. And so Paul makes this argument about the resurrection. And again, <clears throat> one of the uh, powerful ways to kind of bring this letter towards a close, before he, he gives some instruction and salutations, the importance of understanding the resurrection. If only in this life do we have hope, we are mis miserable men and women. But thanks be to God there is a resurrection. Thank God there's a resurrection for the church. And we were at Hillary's funeral today, and thank God, you know, Hillary, Hillary had suffered from cerebral palsy, and, um, you know, she doesn't have that in heaven. Yeah. And when they come out, she won't get her, she won't get that body that, that, yeah. was, that went into the ground. She's going to get her body the way it was supposed to be. But it'll be a spiritual body. It won't be, it won't be any, any limitations on it. Glory to God. I said glory to God. I mean, that's just, just joy. I said that's just joy. Hallelujah. Let's go, ahead into the, let's go ahead into the 16th chapter. We're going we're to finish tonight and let Paul move. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, he's got to get out of Ephesus. He's been there for two and a half months, I think. Now, concern, now like I said, some, writer, some, some scholars say he was at Ephesus. Some might say he was at Philippi. You know, we've got differences of opinions. We, just, we, you know, we can't just keep going over all of them, so we chose Ephesus because that is where he, he was before he started moving on again. Um, Hallelujah. So they believe he was at Ephesus. Uh, Philippi was uh, a little bit away from there. Yeah, right, right good ways away from there. So uh, I believe he may have been heading toward Philippi next. So Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do you. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay him a store, and, as God has prospered to him, and let there be no gatherings when I come. In other words, you, you promised to take up an offering. Let's go ahead and have it so when I get there, it's already done. 
We don't need to do this. We got to pass the bucket 14 times to get the thing taken care of. Let's go ahead and take care of it. Plan ahead. I'm coming. I want the offerings taken up. Okay? Um, and when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. In other words, they're going to appoint men to take the offering. See, Paul was receiving offerings not for himself, but for the, for the church at Jerusalem. It was in a great persecution in Jerusalem. Great persecution. And he was going to send them there. And if it be meet that I go also, then <clears throat> they should go with me. In other words, if I, if I can go, I'm going to go with them. But if not, you choose me and you're going to have to carry this there. Now I shall come to you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide, yea, in winter with you, that you may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. Hallelujah. Now, now Paul's saying, like, I'm going to come. I hope I can stay with you for the winter, but I may not be able to. I would like to. <clears throat> for a great door and effectual, uh, and effectual is opened unto me, and, and there are many adversaries. Now, Timothy, now he's, he's going, so I'm dealing with some stuff. There's some adversity I'm dealing with. Um, I want to get there and spend the winter with you, but I may not be able, to be able to do that. But if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord as I also do. In other words, take care of him and watch out for the jerks in the church or give him, will give him a hard time. Amen? Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may also come to me, for I look for him with the brethren. It's touching our brother Apollos. I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have convenient time. You remember uh, um, you had Apollos. Um, yeah, Apollos. I'm trying to think. Apollos and Aquila. You know, Priscilla and Aquila. But pa Apollos was one of the people that, remember Paul said, uh, one is a Cephas, one is of Apollos, one is of this. Apollos was one of the teachers in the church. <clears throat> and... Um, was, was, and Paul wanted him to go there, but he just didn't think it was the right time for him to go. Um, but he, would, he, he said he was going to come. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong. Let all things be done with charity, or all, all things be done with love. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, Stephanus that is the first fruits of Achaia, and they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Well, I, I would just, wouldn't that be cool if we had more people who addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints? Amen. That ye submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. I am glad at the coming of Stephanus and uh, Fortunius and Achaius, for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied. In other words, he's had three people come and help him and bring him help and aid that they hadn't been able to do. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge ye them that they are such. The churches of Asia salute you, Aquila and Priscilla salute you with much in the Lord, with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you, um, greet one another with a holy kiss. Today, we would say greet each other with a holy handshake. I remember there's one guy back in our church in Greenville, uh, back when we were in the old storefront there, at the Faith and Victory in Greenville, Pastor Zabowski. There was one guy, we called him Brother Lips. Because he went around and chased the women down, wanted to kiss them, and we had to stop and say, You can't do it. Janie would run. But Janie's 5'2, he was about 6'3. So she could just duck under people and get away. You know? Because he, he was always trying to kiss everybody on the cheek. And the pastor had to pull him outside and say, brother, you just can't, we're going around kissing all the women. He only went to kiss the women, by the way. Yeah. He said, well, the Bible says greet the other one in the holy kiss. Well, in today's terminology, that means greeting with a handshake. Now, unless you're in that, if you're, if you're not Italian or some of the European countries, you give them a, great, a holy handshake. You go to Italy, and you, you get taken off guard. I mean, you walk in, they go, so good to have you. Mwah, mwah. And you're like, where I come from, we hurt people over that. But you can't do that because that's their culture, you know. Hallelujah. Um, the salutation of me, Paul, with my own hand. If any man not love not the Lord Jesus, let him be anathema. Maranatha. Now, this is not a term together. Anathema means cursed, and then maranatha means the Lord will come. Okay? So it's two different words, two different statements. Let him be accursed. Then he says, let the Lord come. He's not saying, let him be accursed, the Lord will come. Okay, he's saying that if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, accursed. And then Paul says, let the Lord come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Everybody say hallelujah. First Corinthians is over. Wow. There's a lot there. 
There's a whole lot there. His second letter is not as, uh, not as stinging. He does, he, you know, he, he, he's a little bit different uh, cadence and tone to it. Um, <clears throat> the first one was he was dealing with a bunch of mess. He had to clean it up. All right? Praise the Lord. So next week we'll get into second. We'll, we'll, we'll find out where Paul gets to. Actually, we'll, we'll talk about first where Paul gets to after finishing writing this and then where he gets to and then we'll pick up from there and, and let him write Second Corinthians. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.